We spent the last episode cleaning the engine block from our cheap 454, and this time we're going to get to a lot of the smaller parts. The last time we rebuilt an engine on this channel, we mostly stuck to degreaser and soapy water to clean parts. And while there are a lot of other methods I would like to try in the future, we're gonna keep it simple this time and do the same thing. The only difference is that instead of dunking our pistons in a bucket full of degreaser, I went out and got this parts washer. I chose this one because it was cheap, the size I was looking for, I was able to get it locally, and unlike the Harbor Freight model, I don't hate the color. Since we'll be using it quite a bit in this episode, it seems like now is a good time to talk about it. It went together easily, and it seems like a straightforward, but relatively solid design. Something I didn't like was that there was no seal between the lid and the body, but we can remedy that with some regular old weather stripping. It only took a few minutes to run this all the way around the inside of the lid, and it was totally worth it because you can actually roll the parts washer around without it splashing out everywhere. Another thing I didn't care for was how thin and relatively flimsy the insert was for the actual workspace. It would be fine for small parts, but if I were to put something like a cylinder head in here, there would be a lot of flex. It's also putting all of that load on these relatively small and basic steel tabs. So to quickly and easily add some support for the center, we have this spare piece of exhaust tubing we're gonna cut up. This is a standard piece of two and a half inch exhaust tubing, and we're cutting out two pieces that are three and three its inches tall. The chop saw easily dices that up, and this is what we're left with. With those two pieces positioned at the center of the basin, we now have a totally solid work surface. I thought about notching or drilling the tubing so that the cleaner would naturally settle to the bottom of the basin still, but it didn't seem like it caused an issue. The cleaner we're going to use isn't anything too strong, it's just common, cheap purple power. I like it for jobs like this because it doesn't put off real nasty fumes, and it's not so aggressive that it'll eat plastic or rubber parts with just a little bit of exposure. We'll pour this entire 5 gallon container of it into our parts washer. Part of the appeal of these washers is that they come with an electric pump that circulates the cleaner. The pump that came with this model seems to work just fine, although there's not a whole lot of filtration and the pressure is a little bit on the high side. This results in cleaner kind of just splashing everywhere, which was not something I was a fan of. One of the things that I tried to help remedy both of these problems was to take a simple fuel filter and tape and hose clamp it onto the end of the nozzle. Since the filter outlet was larger than the nozzle inlet, this actually worked really well to reduce the splashing, the only problem was the filter clogged pretty quickly. Which also tells you that the built-in felt pad filter is maybe not doing the best job. What I ended up doing was really not using the pump much at all. For almost all of the cleaning you'll see in this video, I was just using an empty soup can to pour the cleaner around. This does negate some of the benefits of having an actual parts washer, but honestly that was just fine with me and it worked out really well. We'll be sitting here in front of the parts washer to clean off almost all of the small parts in this engine. And we'll start here, cleaning the main caps from the engine block. These are already pretty clean, with just some oil varnish and buildup on the flat surfaces. After a little bit of initial cleaning, I decided to just soak them all in the degreaser for a while. We'll place them all in this plastic bin with their bearing shells removed, pour in some more purple power, and just let them sit for a while. After about two hours, we have them back in the parts washer and we'll give them all a good scrubbing. There are really an infinite number of ways to clean parts, but we're just going to be sticking with the basics here, and a plastic bristle brush and degreaser will be doing most of the work. More time would have been even better, but after just two hours, almost everything is coming right off of them with just a light brushing. Some of the parts we'll be cleaning with a brass or even a stainless steel brush, but the plastic brush splashes the least, and for most of the internal engine parts, it is totally adequate. It's just like brushing your teeth. If you have big cast iron teeth and you've been gargling used motor oil for a couple of years, I guess. Pretty soon, we're giving the parts a final rinse, and we'll take them outside to give them a spray down with brake cleaner. Washing and scrubbing them again with soapy water would really be the best way to clean them off, but the brake cleaner does a good job at removing any degreaser left over, and it does it quick. We'll let the main caps sit and dry for a few minutes, then we'll come back in and spray them all down with WD-40. This light coating will prevent any rust, and we'll cocoon the parts in plastic wrap to keep them totally clean. 
This is the same basic process that we'll keep repeating for most of the parts in the engine. And next in line to be cleaned are the pistons. We won't be removing the wrist pins, but everything else has to come off. We'll start with the compression rings, removing them using a standard ring spreader tool. Basically, all you have to do is slide the tool into the open end of the piston ring and spread it over the top of the piston. The inside edges of those rings can be pretty sharp, so be careful not to gouge anything. Once the two compression rings are off of the piston, we can manually disassemble the oil control ring assembly. The control rings themselves are thin enough that they can just be unwound by hand. Then for the expander ring, you just need to find the end of it so you can spread it open and pull it off. And that's the whole process, we just need to do that seven more times. For some of the pistons, the process is as simple as repeating those steps over and over, but on a few of these, the rings are looking pretty stuck. In this case, it appears to be the same water and rust problem that we saw on the cylinder walls. On this top compression ring, one side is stuck in place while the other side can still move. To free up the stuck side, we're going to use a small punch and a hammer. We have to be careful not to damage the ring groove on the piston, but some of these rings were pretty stuck in place. Once both ends of the ring are out of the groove, we can use the ring spreader to hold on to it, make sure it is totally free, then lift it off. Well, it would be nice if things always worked out like that, but in this case, the other end of the piston ring was so stuck in place, it broke before coming out. So at least it's halfway out, and the other half will have to pry out by hand. And of course, the lower ring on this piston was also stuck in that same way. However, it wasn't stuck quite as badly, and it came off in one piece. The oil control and expander rings aren't nearly as tight of a fit, so none of them gave us any trouble. We'll continue disassembling the pistons, and along the way we ran into quite a few stuck rings. Going through that process on the work surface of the parts washer did the trick for all except for this one. Of course, this was the piston from Rusty Cylinder number 3. I was able to get the lower compression ring off, as well as the oil control rings, but that top ring just wouldn't budge. I gave it a bit of a brushing and tried to get the degreaser to soak in and help break it loose, but it was still stuck. So, with some paper towels to protect it, we'll clamp it down lightly in the vise. The problem with this one was that both sides of the ring were stuck in, so there wasn't a good starting point. To help make one, we'll use this pointed chisel to beat away at the ends of the ring. This end was just chipping, but luckily when we flipped the chisel around, the other end came loose. Then we were able to get a roll pin punch in there, and a few sharp taps got the ring moving. So we were able to take it back to the parts cleaner, and that ring came right off. We'll continue to go through and de-ring the pistons until we've gotten through all eight of them. Then we'll go through and remove all of the bearing caps and the bearing shells. We left all of the bearings installed on their rods so that if there were any wear problems we could see them and know where they came from. But thankfully the wear patterns on the bearings and crankshaft looked fine, there wasn't anything too abnormal. Once we have all of the caps separated, we're going to place the pistons sideways at the bottom of the parts washer. I wanted to let them soak for a bit to help break down everything that stuck to them. We'll close the lid and leave them in there, coming back to check around three hours later. On this piston, we can clearly see which side was submerged, and the degreaser is definitely cleaning things up. The story is the same for all of them, so I just spun them around and set them back in. A few hours later, I moved them one more time, and then let them sit upright in the parts washer overnight. This, I think, was actually a mistake. You see, I didn't know this before leaving the pistons in, and I guess I probably should have tested it, but I'd never let aluminum parts soak for that long in purple power. In our case, it seemed like it was just a visual thing, as they became a bit discolored, but otherwise cleaned up just fine. This is just yet another thing to keep in mind and be careful about. I wouldn't leave pistons to soak overnight again, but we will keep using the degreaser poured over the pistons to help clean them up. We'll go over all the surfaces on the piston, the connecting rod, the rod bolt threads, and the bearing surface to make sure they're all totally clean. There are a lot of little nooks and crannies on the pistons, so we'll reach as much as we can. We'll also make sure that all of the wrist pins move freely in the pistons. Then we need to come back through and clean out the ring grooves. 
There doesn't appear to be a huge amount of carbon buildup in these, but there's definitely plenty of rust and other crud we need to get out of the way. We're going to break one of the cleaner of the old compression rings in half and use the original, not the broken end, as a cleaning tool. The machined ends of the ring are very sharp and flat at the bottom, so they're perfect for cleaning out these grooves. Keep as shallow of an angle as possible and be careful not to scratch into the aluminum. Sometimes you'll find a tough spot that'll need two or three passes, but eventually you can dig your way down to the original metal surface and then continue working your way all the way around the piston. Then we'll rinse it off and go back to the wire brush to clean things up a little bit and get a better look at what's going on. Everything that's not bare aluminum needs to be out of the grooves. And pretty soon the pistons are looking, well, as good as they're going to. The grooves are clean and we're in good shape. So let's get back to it and take care of the rest of the pistons. Some of the pistons are still a little bit discolored from either the purple power or the oil that had been absorbed into it, but either way, I don't think it's going to cause any problems and they're looking pretty good. Just like the main caps, we'll go out and rinse them all off with brake cleaner. We'll let that flash off for a minute, then come back with WD-40 and give them all a nice coat. Then they too will get packed away in plastic wrap. Once this has been done for all of them, the piston assemblies are almost good to go, but we still need to clean the rod caps. And so those, along with all the engine hardware, rocker arms, and pretty much any other small piece, we're going to leave soaking in this plastic bin. Around two hours later, and every once in a while after that, we'll come back to move all the parts around and stir up all the cleaner. And just like the pistons, we let those soak overnight before coming back to them. We went through all of those parts using our brushes and the degreaser in the parts washer. Soaking the bolts overnight did a great job at removing any thread sealer and it just took a few quick swipes with a brush to clean anything like that off. We'll also go through and wash off all the parts from the rocker assemblies, all the connecting rod caps, and the push rods. This is what those grimy push rods looked like as they were removed from the engine. They had two hours to soak and came out looking very good. We sprayed through each one with brake clean to make sure they were clear and wiped them all down with paper towels. For most of the small hardware, we just wiped the parts down, spritzed them with WD-40, and then closed them into Ziploc bags. We also cleaned off the old camshaft in the parts washer, although I ended up deciding not to use it. With just a little bit of brushing and then red scotch bright on the journals and lobes, it cleaned up really well though. If I weren't looking for a little bit more lift out of it, I'm sure that camshaft would have worked just fine. That got cleaned up and wrapped the same way everything else did, and it'll probably be sitting on a shelf for quite a while. The next thing we'll clean up is the crankshaft, which, lucky for us, was also in good shape. There are no scratches, gouges, or uneven wear on any of the bearing surfaces. Later, we'll go through and properly measure the journals, but for now it's enough to know that they're in good shape. The only surface that's not looking so hot is the rear seal surface, so we'll have to give that some extra special attention when cleaning it up. Before getting to that, we will be replacing the timing set, so the old gear has to come off. We gave the gear a few gentle taps with the hammer to see if it wanted to come off, but it didn't, so instead of playing nice, we'll use the two-jaw puller to force it off. It only took a few taps from the impact gun to get the gear moving, and once it did, we were able to slide it the rest of the way off by hand. Now we'll flip over to the other end of the crankshaft and work on that rear seal surface. We'll start by giving it a wipe down of WD-40, then we'll break out the red scotch bright and start scrubbing. It was quickly removing the top layer of rust, but it was going to take a while before the surface was totally clean and shiny again. We'll just keep going back and forth between spraying the surface down with WD-40, rubbing it down with the scotch bright, and wiping it off with a towel. Pretty soon, the ceiling surface is looking somewhat presentable, and we'll move on to cleaning up the rest of the rear crank flange. We want to give extra attention to the outside edge where the flex plate rides, and the inside edge where the snout of the torque converter sits. That surface in particular needs to be cleaned so that the converter can center correctly in the back of the crankshaft. And once those are looking good, we'll go through with pretty much that same process to buff all of the journals with that red scotch bright. 
All the journals felt perfectly smooth, but this will help to knock off any microscopic high spots, clean up old oil varnish, and generally give the surface a finish that will play nice with the new bearings we'll be installing. Once that's done, all of the surfaces are definitely looking nice and shiny, and it's time to give the crankshaft a thorough wash. We're going to be doing this one outside with clean water because it is vitally important that this be sparkling clean. Plain old soap and water really is the best way to do a final cleaning of a part like this. We'll use a variety of plastic bristle brushes to scrub down every single surface, and use plenty of soap along with a pipe brush to scrub clean the oil galleries. We'll keep rinsing everything off and scrubbing and work our way all the way from one end of the crankshaft to the other. Once we've brushed down all of the surfaces and cleaned out all of the passages, we'll give it a really good rinse off. And we'll spray through each and every oil passage to make sure they're clean as can be. Then, just like we did for the engine block, we'll use a blowgun hooked to the air compressor to spray the crankshaft dry. We'll make sure to get all the bolt holes, the oil passages, and, of course, the journals. Then the whole thing will get a thorough spray down with WD-40. We'll also spray it down all of the oil passages to make sure they're coated and protected as well. We'll give the whole thing one final cleaning wipe down with shop towels, make sure it is still fully oiled, and cover it up to protect it from dust. This was actually pretty much the last thing we cleaned because it was so large I didn't want to deal with trying to wrap it up and keep it clean while other work was done. And rest assured, there is plenty of work left. So I hope you're ready for even more cleaning next time. <laughs>